Okay, so welcome everyone. Um, this chapter, or this lecture rather, deals with two chapters, chapter 7 and chapter 8. Chapter 7 deals with survey research, chapter 8 uh, deals with quasi-experimental research. May kind of made sense to me at least um, to combine these chapters and discuss them together. And um, well, let's get started. There shouldn't be, or shouldn't take too long to get through this material. Again, um, some of this we, we've already discussed. So what exactly is survey research? Um, well, survey research is a quantitative and qualitative method with two important characteristics. The first is that the variables of interest are measured using self-reports, and we know that self-reports can be either questionnaires or they can be interviews. Um, a second major characteristic is considerable attention is paid to the issue of sampling. So survey researchers in particular have a very strong preference for large and random samples, typically speaking. Um, so most survey research is non-experimental, but surveys can and are uh, used within experimental research uh, quite quite frequently. Um, and not just in terms of, let's say, surveying people for opinions per se, uh, but surveys can also be used as a dependent variable uh, of, in an experimental um, study. So re survey research may have its roots in English and American quote-unquote social surveys that were conducted around the turn of the 20th century by researchers and reformers who wanted to document the extent of social, social problems um, that existed in society, such as poverty and, and crime. Um, by the 1930s, the, the U.S. government was conducting surveys to document economic and social conditions in the country. Um, at about that time, several researchers who had already made a name for themselves in market research, as, which is studying consumer preferences for American businesses, uh, turned their attention to election polling. Um, from market research and election polling, survey research made its way into several academic fields, including political science, sociology, and public health, uh, where it continues to be one of the primary approaches to collecting new data. Survey research has a strong historical association um, with the social psychological study of such things such as attitudes and stereotypes and prejudice. Um, survey research continues to be an important, continues to be an important part of psychology even today. For example, survey data have been instrumental in estimating the prevalence of various mental disorders and identifying statistical relationships among disorders and various other factors. Um, so survey research, we'll see how it differs from some of the experimental designs and even some of the non-experimental designs that we've already discussed. Um, it involves, quote unquote, surveying uh, a large number of people. And um, this technique of data collection especially when it when it's done well um, can give us a, a very good glimpse or give us some insight into to what's going on in the country um, and certainly those what's going on in the country or what's going on with the people in the country um, those are areas that would be that would certainly be interesting to um, psychologists, particularly social psychologists and um, clinical psychologists, even developmental psychologists. Right? Okay, so how do we construct a survey? Um, well, below is, is a model that is presented um, in your textbook, and it 
presents um, the construction of survey, or so let's say the process of um, surveying, at least on the, the respondents end, um, as a cognitive process that people engage in um, when they are responding to a, a survey item. So uh, the people who we are surveying are called respondents. So respondents must first interpret the question. So they have to take a look at what you are asking them um, and try to figure out exactly what it is that, that you're asking. Uh, they will next need to retrieve the relevant information from their memory um, concerning that, that question that, that you asked. They would, they would next need to form a tentative judgment, which is a preliminary judgment essentially form a preliminary answer to this question. Um, so kind of the, the answer that first comes to, to mind, let's say. Um, from there, they will need to convert that preliminary judgment, that preliminary answer, into one of the response options that you provided them. This, of course, is assuming that we're dealing with close-ended questions here, but you, you have given respondents um, a, a way of answering uh, a question. You've given them options uh, to choose from. Um, so they have their initial answer. They'll then need to see how that initial fits, answer fits in with the, the options that they're, they're able to choose. Um, and they might choose an option and then say, uh, well, maybe that's not 100% accurate, but me, maybe one of these other choices is, is a better option, right? So they're, the final step in this process might be that the uh, respondents will edit those initial um, responses as necessary. So, um, Completing a survey, right, is a, is a complex cog cognitive process there. So we want to make sure that we, we do it correctly, that we set up our surveys correctly to, or to do them well in such a way that we're going to get good data from, from our respondents. So let's take this questionnaire or questionnaire item, um, as an example. So we might ask somebody, how many alcoholic drinks do you consume in a typical day? And let's say we give them how many answers here? Five potential um, answers that they could choose from. They could say a lot more than average, somewhat more than average, average, somewhat fewer than average, or a lot fewer than average. Let's just think about if you were presented with this type of question. Um, I mean, first thing that comes to my mind is, well, what do we mean by average, right? Whose average are we, are we talking about here? Um, so the question might seem straightforward at, at first glance, but there's actually um, a, a couple of difficulties that it can Opposed to to the respondents, um, again they first need to interpret this question. So, how many alcoholic drinks do you consume in a typical day? All right. So, what do we mean typical day? So, it's not a party day, not a weekend, just like a weekday. Because you know, but if I don't drink anything in a "Quote unquote typical day in you know, a weekday, but I get wasted on on the weekends. Um, so we need to kind of figure out what exactly it is that this question is asking, and you and I might come up with different interpretations of it. Right? I might average all the days together in the week, and you might say, "No, typical just means yeah, most days, right?" So there are different ways to interpret this. Um, the respondent then must retrieve relevant information from their memory to answer this question. So they need to sit there for a moment and 
and think. Um, think about how many drinks do they do they drink in a typically in a typical day, right? There might be some. Okay, well, uh, these on the weekends it's this many, and during the weekdays maybe this. Except if if it's if I have a night class, whatever might be going on there, uh, they have to retrieve that information. Then they must use this information to arrive at a tentative or preliminary judgment here. So a preliminary judgment might be, yeah, no, it's average. It's, 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 not, it's about average, right? Um, so then, or you could say, well, uh, yeah, it's normal. It's a normal um, uh, amount of drinks that I consume. Um, okay, so I have my preliminary answer, normal amount of drinks. Okay, then I must, uh, the respondent must format this this preliminary answer here in terms of the options that we provided them. Normal is not an option. So average is an option though. And average is, is close to normal. So, you know, kind of think of the two uh, synonyms, right, of, of each other. Um, not really, but colloquially speaking, uh, they're often used interchangeably. So we'll say, okay, we'll, we'll go with average, right? Um, then they must decide whether they want to report the, the response that they've come up with, whether they want to edit it in some way. So I'm saying, okay, yeah, average. Oh, wait, but, hmm, wait, but what is average? I remember when Brown taught drug use and abuse, and he was saying, you know, like uh, two drinks is about the average or the, you know, the statistical average or and average is such a <laughs> ambiguous word there. So you might think, all right, you know, maybe it's somewhat more than average or yeah, maybe, maybe we'll, I'll go with that one instead, right? So you can see that there's a cognitive process going on. Forgive my, my fake acting there. I was trying to convey cognitive processes and difficulties and struggles there. But you could imagine um, for a question that is not so benign, if you were asked questions about more complicated, um, say, topics, such as what do you think? What is your opinion uh, uh, on something? What is your attitude towards something? Um, what is what are you feeling? What is your emotion? Uh, what what kind of emotions are you experiencing at at the moment? Those things can be a little harder than just trying to to you know estimate or give a uh, a good indication of how many drinks that you consume in a typical day. Um, we, we typically ask more complicated types of questions like that, at least in, in psychological research, right? Okay, so it, when it comes to um, survey research, uh, this complexity of the process that, that we have just been talking about um, can often lead to unintended say influences on on our respondents answers so um, in other words the way that we phrase certain questions um, the way that we present questions the types of options in terms of answering a question um, that we we give participants or or respondents um, even the order in which we ask particular questions, all of these things can actually influence the answers that we, we get from respondents. So um, when we, we talk about all of those, those things, we're referring to context effects. So these are effects that are not related to the content of the, the item on our survey, but to the context in which the item appears. So it's not necessarily the, the question itself, but maybe how it's worded, 
when when we ask, asked it, uh, did we ask a another type of question before it that might influence someone's response? Um, it that last one right there is what well, is an example or what we would call an item order effect. So there's a number of different content or context uh, effects. Um, the item order effect is when the order in which the items are presented affects people's responses. So one example of this that comes out of your textbook here is that a researcher Fritz Strack and his colleagues asked college students about both their general life satisfaction and their dating frequency. So when the life satisfaction item came up first, the correlation between these two variables uh, was only negative 0.12. So we're looking at a really small, almost meaningless negative correlation between these two items when you ask about life satisfaction first. Um, so this suggests there's a very weak relationship between these two items. However, when you ask about dating frequency, you ask about uh, people's dating frequency, you ask that question first, um, then you ask about life satisfaction. The correlation jump between these two variables, variables jumps up to positive 0.66 which is a moderate to strong correlation, positive correlation. So in, in this case, we, we see a complete opposite effect, um, complete opposite relationship between these two variables, all depending on which question we asked first. And if you think about it, it kind of makes sense. If we're asking about life satisfaction and, and dating frequency, uh, most people will like to have romantic and sexual partners, um, and that's a very important part of human relationships, of, of happiness, right? Um, for most people, not, not everyone, but most, most of us. Um, so if you ask about life satisfaction first, you might say, yeah, okay, I'm doing pretty well, right? And then that's that's an emotion type of question. That's an emotive question. You're asking them about their, their satisfaction with something. Um, and then you're following up by asking a factual question. You know, how are you in a relationship? When was your last relationship? Um, how often do you go on dates? How many people have you dated? So on and so forth. These are factual questions. So it, their life satisfaction question might be, let's say, less likely to influence a, a factual question. However, when you ask that factual question first, what are you doing? Well, you're basically reminding people who let's say are not having a lot of luck in the in the dating department you're reminding them that they're not having a lot of luck in the dating department so then you're asking and how happy are you with life oh i don't know now that you reminded me that i can't get laid or i can't get a date I, it kind of sucks actually right um or the people who are having a really good, say, a very successful dating life, romantic sexual life, let's say. Um, you ask that question first, those people are reminded of all the great experiences that uh, they're having with, with all of these other people, let's say. And they're reminded of how good life is right how satisfied they are um with their with their life at this point so yeah the order of the items can actually affect the answers that you get um so the response options that you give 
people to do that, you know, what they get to choose from um, as their answer could also have unintended um, effects on people's um, responses. So let's say, for example, when people are asked how often they are really irritated. So you, we ask people, how often are you really irritated? And then we give responses that range from, let's say, less than once a year to more than once a month. Okay, so let's say we'll we'll use that as our first uh, the first example of of let's say how people can answer this question: less than once a year to more than once a month. Well, with those types of answer choices people will tend to think of the major irritations that they've had, like the big ones that they've had. Why? Well, because we're saying less than once a year or more than once a month. Those are still, like, there's not a whole lot of in-betweens in there. So people are going to be thinking, all right, so am I irritated more than once a month? less than once a year they're going to be focused more on like times that they're really irritated maybe like when they really are pissed off so they'll actually tend to uh, be more likely to under report how frequently that they're irritated or they might say yeah i'm not really irritated all that frequently right but if we give them different options if we say less than once a day to several times a month well now you're giving people a greater amount of time or a greater amount of opportunity um to reflect on you know when they're irritated right like now they're thinking about it on a daily okay like in a day how often i can yeah, i kind of get pissed off more of, a couple times a day at least, right? So people will actually start thinking, if you gave them these these two options, they'll start thinking about some of the more minor irritations that they have. Like, oh, I had to wait in line, or this person cut me off, or it was just so irritating. Um, they'll think of more minor irritations, and they'll actually report of feeling irritated more frequently. So you have to kind of be careful about the options that you give people um, to choose from in terms of answering their questions because you could get very different res responses just by how you, um, not only how you ask the question, right, but also the options that you give them and from the item order effect, if you're asking more than one question, just the order in which you ask the questions can also change the responses that you get. So, um, how can we, let's say, try to avoid some of these, these context effects? Uh, one way of doing it, or let's say the, the first way, the first, the easiest, the first step is to make sure you write some good survey items. Make sure you write some good questions here. Um, when it comes to item effects, so or the item order effects rather, counterbalancing. Make sure that for you know, you're going to be surveying a thousand people, make sure you randomize the, the order of those questions. Um, so you'll notice because you're you're all taking online classes now. All your classes are online. Your professors um, are likely randomizing the order in which the questions appear on an exam for a uh, multiple choice exam, or uh, the not just the questions, but also the answers that might uh, appear on an exam or a quiz. That's done for a couple of reasons. You know it cuts down on cheating a little bit or makes it just a little bit more uh, difficult to cheat. Um, but it also helps with some of those item order effects that um, we, we were talking about, right? 
But so randomization, counterbalancing these items um, in terms of how you're asking them, you can help control or take into account or control for um, item order effects. When it comes to the responses, we'll we'll talk about that in a minute. What's the you know best way to to collect this information? What are how should we we phrase these um, choices that we that we give participants? Um, okay, well, like I said, how we can try to to get the best responses, the best answers, most accurate information that we can. Let's start by writing some good survey items um, and survey items are going to to fall into one of two major categories the first is open-ended items and open-ended items are when we simply ask a question and allow participants to answer in any way that they want um, we basically just get narratives right we ask people a question and they tell us an answer in their own words, so to speak. Uh, so an example might be, what is the most important thing to teach children to prepare them for life? We're not going to give them, you know, a bullet point that they, or uh, let's say a list of questions or a list of responses that they're going to check off or anything. Um, they might have to write this out in a sentence, or if it's a an interview, they would tell you they would just speak it um, another example of an open-ended question is please describe a time when you were discriminated against uh, because of your age so you're basically asking people to tell a story tell a little narrative let's say um, open-ended questions are are useful when researchers don't know how participants might respond or they want to avoid influencing participants' responses. Um, the problem with open-ended items is that for us as psychologists, um, you need to turn those open-ended responses, those narratives you get, you need to turn them into quantitative data. You need to to code them um, through a process called content coding that you have to go through these narratives go through these stories and code them in ways that we can do statistical analyses for and boy that is not fun to do that's a long tedious process um, and I would say even people who do qualitative research and all they do is open-ended item open-ended questions I'm sure they will they will agree at least the, the friends that I have <laughs> we, we could all come together and agree that content coding is really long boring task uh, to do so we usually give it to research assistants sorry um, but yeah, you, you get unfiltered, unbiased information, right? Or less biased information coming out. You're not giving them, uh, your participants, a set of options that they can choose from. They're just telling you what it is. Um, it's, it's analyzing this stuff that's going to be not fun uh, to do later on, right? So by and large, we... I say we psychological behavioral researchers uh, will use close-ended items and this is when we ask a question and then provide a set of response options for participants to choose from so um, the question that we just asked about how much alcohol um, people drank in a typical day we can ask them that uh, well that was a close-ended item we gave them a, a list of options uh, that they can they can choose from um, but we could have given them let's say a different um, set of options or we, we could have given them a different way to answer that question 
Uh, we could have just asked them straight out, how many drinks do you have in a, in a typical day? That's an open-ended item. You don't really have to code it, though. Hopefully they're just giving you a number, right? And they're not going to go on, give you their whole life story or anything. Um, but we could also ask them, let's say, on a scale of... Um, what? Oh, okay. So these are just other examples of, of closed item or closed uh, ended items or closed ended questions here um i thought this was related back to that that alcohol question but these are just different examples so we might ask somebody on a scale of zero meaning no pain at all to 10 the worst pain ever experienced how much pain are you in right now this is a question that's actually used um, very often in medical settings when you are in the hospital um, or in urgent care, right? Um, do doctor or nurse or physician assistant might come in and say, you know, on a scale of 110, like how painful is this? The problem is, of course, um, we all have different ideas of what a 10 is. So, you know, there's... Uh, it's, uh, that gender stereotype of of the man flu, right? That any time you know we get a cold, it's like the worst thing in our lives, right? We are all achy and stuff. Women go through childbirth, but you know, as soon as you know, a guy gets the sniffles, we're it's the end of our lives, right? It's oh my god, the worst. I'm guilty of man flu <laughs> or man cold or whatever the hell uh, that is. Um, I can't deal with grogginess, head stuff, even headaches. Like they start getting to me psychologically. Um, cutting my finger open, something like that, it don't doesn't really bother me. Um, you can't see it here, but. 10, 15, 15 years ago, maybe? I was, I was like five hours away from getting on a flight to uh, to Rome, actually. And I was living in Brooklyn. I was just uh, right across the street from Coney Island Hospital, for any of you who, who knows that, that area down there. And I was just washing a glass, getting you know everything cleaned up because I was going to be gone for for a while, and I'm washing this glass, and then I just hear a pop, and then I stop, and I'm like, okay, so this glass just broke, did, did it cut me, did it cut me, and I'm like, I'm waiting, and I was like, a couple seconds, felt so relieved, I'm like, Sh I might have missed the bullet, right, dodged the bullet, and then, <laughs> all this blood just come coming all down onto the kitchen floor. I was, I was like, nope, I did not miss that one. I didn't feel it at all, right? I did not feel it at all, and I'm hoping that's the most I ever bleed, because it was a lot of blood. Cut it right down to the bone, right, right there, right? So I didn't feel that pain. Um... When I get a sinus headache, a sinus infection, the the, the pain, the groggy, like pressure stuff, I I can't function. Like I can't. I'm like, kill me now, just put me out of my misery. Um, in fact, when I I walked over to Coney Island Hospital with my my hand over my head, pressing down, um. The thing that hurt the worst, and any of you who've had stitches before, you know what I'm talking about. When they put those lidocaine shots in there, sticking the needle into this open wound, I'm like, "Can why don't you just stitch me up without those? That was insane pain. And I'm like, I don't understand this. They, it took them forever to do it. I'm like, you could have only had like five six stitches in there I'm like you there's no way this that stitches would have hurt any more than that 
than those needles, but I'm going off on a tangent here. Um, my point being is that these types of scales are inherently problematic because um, I didn't feel any pain when I cut my finger and when it was open, when it was cut open, bleeding out everywhere, seeing the bone, I didn't feel anything. When they, you know, cleaned it out and stuff, I did eh, uncomfortable stuff. Sticking lidocaine needles in there. I'm like, this is what childbirth must feel <laughs> like. The worst feeling in the world. Um, or if I get the, you know, uh, the man flu, the sniffles, the cold. I'm, I'm, I'm a, a baby when it comes to that. Um, point being... Your five on this scale or your seven on this scale could be very different than my five or my seven uh, on this scale. Another example of a closed or closed ended um, item is: Have you ever, in your adult life, been depressed for a period of two weeks or more? Uh, and in this case, it's just a yes or no uh, response, right? So. Um, when it says your adult life, have you ever been depressed? It's a problematic question, uh, not for political or social reasons. It's just the wording of it. Uh, have you been depressed? Well, what are we really trying to ask the respondents? Have they been sad for two weeks or more? Or are we asking, have they had a major depressive episode here. Um, especially as psychologists, if we're asking, you know, people about depression, we have to be really careful. Depression and this term depressed have very specific meanings that are often different than how people use this term in everyday language, right? When you say, oh, my my uh, cat died. I'm I'm so depressed. You know, yeah, your your mood is certainly depressed, but you're not experiencing depression, right? Not yet, at least. Uh, that's a certain criteria that you have to meet in there. So it's already the question's not great. Um, but this again is an example of a close-ended question. In this case, it's a it's a binary choice. It's a yes or no. Nothing nothing in between on this one. Um, so all close-ended items include a set of response options from which a participant must choose. So for categorical variables like sex, race, or political preference, uh, the categories are usually listed out. And participants have to choose the one or ones, if there's multiple, um, to which they belong. And you might say, well, when we, we ask these types of questions, well, things like sex, race, uh, gender or gender identity, political party preference, sexual orientation, um, all of these things are, you know, or education level, are what we call sociodemographic information. Sometimes those things are helpful um, in terms of understanding whether certain sociodemographic variables are associated with some of the things that we are trying to ascertain, trying to um, evaluate in our surveys. Um, the problem, let's say, when it comes to these types of questions uh, is that you're often going to um, you run the, the risk of leaving people out. Um, so if you have something like what is your sex, male, female, well, you're not taking into account people who are transgender or non-binary, right? Um, so you you need your categories to be, um, say, as exhaustive as possible, to be as inclusive as possible. Um, 
when it comes to questions like these, sociodemographic stuff, especially when it comes to stuff like race uh, and gender or um, say ethnicity, there, for me personally, I tend to make these open-ended type of questions. So I ask somebody, what is your gender identity, right? Um, and let them fill it in. And then when I'm entering the data, I'll go back and code it, right? Most of the time, it's going to just be male and female, transgender. Uh, people make up a small percentage of the overall population. Um, so it's not going to take you a whole lot of time or anything uh, to to just let people identify however they they want to identify um, the same thing or the same let's say problem comes up when you ask about race or ethnicity um, putting say black white asian latino right well maybe or i mean the 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 old standard for APA, how we would refer to people who um, are typically now referred to as Latino or Latinx, um, used to be Hispanic. But Hispanic, a term doesn't cover all the, the people who might otherwise identify as Latino. So for those questions, I always find it easier just to ask people, um, how do you identify? And then I can go and code it later. You know, typically if I'm asking about race or ethnicity, I'm typically just because it's my line of research looking for major differences in race. So, um, basically people who identify as white compared to people who I don't identify as white white people still being the majority um, in this country and the majority culture in this country. I'm typically interested in people who belong to the majority culture or the majority uh, race and those who don't belong to uh, the majority culture or majority race. There's still lots of differences amongst all of the, the people who are in there. And if you get a large sample that you get a lot of people um, of all of those various different non-majority races or ethnicities um, or even religions, any any category here uh, that you typically don't get a whole lot of, um, especially you can imagine if I'm doing research at SUNY Oneana, we are largely a white we largely have a white student body and a largely a white uh, faculty. So it would be really hard for me to get a large enough sample of, say, uh, black students to be able to compare them to, say, white students. Um, just because the way that research is done, I might not have, I might only have a handful of black students in there. It's not going to be statistically significant. I might need to pair them with, say, um, other, say, non-white uh, participants or people, participants of color and compare these as groups. It's not ideal, but, you know, sometimes you just got to work with what you got. Uh, anyway, that's a long way uh, of saying when it comes to socio-demographic stuff, sometimes it's better to use open-ended items for those types of questions. Um, and then, of course, some people will just try to get political and you say, you know, what what race or ethnicity you identify with and you just leave a blank and people will say human race. And I know I'm like, okay, cool, I get you, I get what you're doing here, but it's not really helping me out <laughs> in this regard. Um, okay, so for these quantitative variables that we're, we're interested in collecting um, numerical data from so we can do statistical analyses, 
Um, we typically use rating scales. So I'm sure you've seen these um, before when you've participated in research or filled out any type of, of survey or you've just experienced these or encountered them rather in your your other classes. So a rating scale is an ordered set of responses that participants must must choose from. Um, so the first rating scale that we, we have here, the strongly agree, agree, neither agree nor disagree, disagree, strongly agree. Um, you might say, well, this is a rating scale that kind of looks like an ordinal scale, right? And rating scales kind of are ordinal scales. Even when we look at, say, this scale down here from 1 to 7, um, extremely unlikely to extremely likely, this particular type of rating scale has a special name. It's called a, a Likert scale, named after Likert, the, the person who invented it. Um, and it's, it's if you think about it, you know enough though. Um, we we treat information that comes from from these types of scales, Likert scales. We kind of just assume well these are interval ordinal scales, right? Well, this is a continuum here, except it's not really a continuum, right? You can choose one, you can choose a two, but you can't choose a one point six or a 1.62, or oh, uh, you can't choose a 2.5 in here, they are actually ordinal scales, uh, except that the, we, when we do statistical analyses, um, we're comparing means, right? Um, and of course, if we're running ANOVAs, we're still interested in the differences between group means, we're just going about examining those differences using analysis of variance, we're, we're analyzing the variance uh, rather than, say, going straight for the means themselves like we do in, in a t-test. So, even though you know, the argument can be made that these are actual actually actual ordinal, ordinal scales, scales uh, um, after, after we got 100, 200, 200 300 people answering, answering on, on, these, on these um, um scales, scales, scales uh, uh, we end up, we end up with, with a mean group of green mean that we, that we often often compare to another group another group mean, mean another another group mean. mean. So, so, for all intents and purposes, purposes they, they act, act like, like interval, interval or normal scales. scales. Uh, 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 but whether we use, we use a, 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 a rating scale, scale that, that just uses words, words up here, here. Uh, uh, or, or some, some might say, well, this is actually, this is actually categorical, categorical, right? This is, seems like a categorical variable, but, but they're arranged in such a way that we can later go in and and code say strongly disagree as a one and disagree as a two and this as a three and agree as a four and strongly agree as a five we could basically treat it like an uh an interval ordinal scale um sometimes you might also find these types of sliding scales so to speak so that um when we ask somebody you know, how friendly does this person appear? On one end, it's extremely unfriendly. On the other one, it's extremely friendly. And the person might have to just mark somewhere, you know, along this continuum. Um, this is actually more like a interval ratio scale because you technically could, right, put a 2.5 in there. I mean, it's... We're not getting absolute numbers out of, out of this per se, um, except now when you see these types of scales on internet surveys, you're actually allowed to put your your mouse, put your uh, cursor on the scale and move it, and it'll give you a, a numerical value. Um, so it is actually 
pretty kind of cool because you can do a 3.2, a 3.5, a 3.4, or 3. Point whatever in there. Um, but the thing that all of these have in common is that they're um, rating scales, right? So when it comes to, let's say, just the, let, let's talk a little bit in terms of um, how many options or how many numbers we should put on, on this Likert scale. Should it be a scale from 0 to 10? Most people kind of understand the idea of a 0 to 10. Um, you know, a 1 to 7 scale, we're going to have to we're going to have to anchor them, right? By saying one meaning extremely unlikely, seven meaning extremely likely. What's the, the optimal uh, number there? Well, five point scales are best for unipolar scales where only one construct is tested. Um, so if we're basically asking the same question uh, or the, uh, we're answering say multiple questions that are all trying to tap into the same construct, the same underlying behavior or the same underlying um, variable that we're interested in. Uh, five point scale is typically uh, more useful. So it, because it gives us a, a, a middle ground where we could say something like never rarely sometimes often always right so if we're all if we're going to use the, that same structure that 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 same response structure um never rarely sometimes often always uh, for every one of our questions five point scales are are probably the best way to go um seven point scales are best for bipolar scales where there's a dichotomous spectrum, such as you like something very much, you like something somewhat, you slightly like it, you like it or you don't like it, you dislike, so on and so forth, right? When you basically have two kind of, let's say, uh, two kinds of dimensions, you have the being high on the spectrum of liking or being low on the spectrum of liking. Um, there's also the potential for nine point scales, which can start getting, you know, kind of giving participants too many, too many options um, in there. But by and large, we're typically going to see five or, or seven point scales when we um, are dealing with Likert scales. Um, okay, so some tips for writing effective items. Um, a rough guideline for writing effective questionnaire items is provided by the Brousseau model, B-R-U-S-O. So uh, the B stands for brief, be brief in your question. So a poor question, a question that's not following this criterion, uh, would say, are you now or have you ever been the possessor of a firearm? That's not very brief. You can do better than that, right? Um, cut it down to, have you ever owned a gun, right? Much more effective um, question in terms of writing these things. Um, relevancy, right? So you throw in a question, what is your sexual orientation? Well, it looks like all these other questions here have to do with gun ownership or gun or, or attitudes towards gun. Why are we asking about sexual orientation? It doesn't seem relevant to, to this survey. So we typically don't want to ask these types of um, personal questions or socio-demographic questions unless they're somehow relevant to the research that we are trying to do. Maybe we want to find out uh, whether or not the LGBT community is um, becoming more 
supportive of uh, of gun ownership or if they're becoming less supportive of gun ownership okay in this case it would make sense to to ask this this type of question otherwise we you know wouldn't we wouldn't ask a question like this this doesn't seem to be related to anything else that we're that we're interested in um you unambiguous so we want to avoid unambiguous or we want to be unambiguous right so you say um a a poor question to to ask would be are you a gun person somebody might be like well what does that mean right does that mean like am i a fanatic does it mean like you know i go out shooting every weekend or every day do i have like 20 gun? what do you mean am i a gun per am, I, am i part of the nra is that what you're asking not really clear right so um a more effective way is to just hey do you currently have a gun right do you currently own one um related to this is the idea of being specific so a poorly worded question would be how much have you read about the new gun control measure and sales tax right a much more effective way of asking this question is how much have you read about the new sales tax right so we're talking about being uh specific we're not we want to know about one thing right this question here how much have you read about the new gun control measure and sales tax you're asking two questions in one how should they answer this if they've read a whole lot about the new gun control measure and they didn't even know that there was a new gun sales tax how would you answer a question like this um this is what we call a double barreled question actually it's when we're asking uh two questions in one so be very specific if you want to know about both of these things ask them in two different questions right one would be how much have you read about the new gun control measure next question how much have you read about the new gun control or the new gun sales tax make them two separate questions um and finally o for objective uh, as objective as possible a poor example of this would be how much do you support uh the new gun control measure um why is that not objective well the word support in there you're not asking I mean, you're it, it's not fully objective because it's giving them the sense that they should support it right or you're asking you know that people might answer in a socially desirable type of way um a better way to answer or to ask this question is what is your view on the new gun control measure so that way you're allowing them to offer negative views right not just support but also opposition to the new gun control measure and this idea of objective questioning um is extremely important because you could get radically different answers just based on how you ask a question um so taking say uh, abortion rights um since it's a controversial topic um especially now with the 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 new um supreme court justice who was just um appointed to to the court uh this is going to be an issue it's gonna it's gonna come up so you might get phone calls uh, or be asked to complete surveys about this ask how or pay attention to how the question is worded um again you can get very different answers depending on how you ask a question if i said to you um 
you know, how much do you agree with this statement? A woman has the right to control her own body, right? Most people are going to be strongly agreeing with that statement. Yeah, of course, right? People, women should have control over their body. Or if I ask you how important it is it that we protect unborn babies, right? They're both questions that have appeared on surveys about abortion. Well, how many people are going to say, yeah, no, let, just kill a bunch of, you know, unborn babies. Who cares about them? Now, both of those questions are what we call loaded questions. Um, you're going to get support for both of those questions, even though one would be seen as a pro-choice question and the other a pro-life question. The same when it comes to immigration. When you say, you know, people should have the, the right to um, seek asylum in the United States and pursue the American dream. Who going to disagree with that, right? It's like, yeah, of course, people should do that. Or you could say, it's important that we could protect our borders to, to keep out criminals and to keep out illegal aliens. Yeah, I support that, too. Like, right, you're going to get the same person might agree with both of those statements there. So, uh, the way that you word questions, we need to, to be objective here, or you're not going to get accurate um, responses. And sometimes that's the point. Sometimes these um, these surveys are purposely designed to show uh, they're politically motivated, let's say. The, the agenda there is to to be able to say, look at all the people who agree with our side, right? Rather than actually getting at, at the truth. Um, okay, so when it comes to conducting surveys, we said um, earlier, um, people who do survey research are typically concerned with large sample sizes. You want to get a, a large number of respondents because Unlike um, the type of experimental research that we do in psychology, we're not testing a variable with a with a survey. We're actually just trying to figure out what most people think. So testing a, a new drug, if it's going to work or not work, we could do that with 100 people or 200 people. Why? Well, because most humans have the same biological processes, right? So we can assume if it's working on this set of 100 people, if we just grab another 100 set of people, like their bodies, like human bodies, of course there's individual differences, but, you know, we all kind of operate the same way physiologically. Um, that's not necessarily true politically or... Um, when it comes to, to social issues or our preferences for various products or, or whatever else people might be might be doing surveys on, um, so we need to sample a different differently. Um, in psychological research, we see we tend to to, to rely on convenient samples, um, and typically again not a major issue for us because we're using random assignment. We're interested in testing the treatment, testing our independent variable, not our participants themselves per se, right? So when it comes to how we collect our, or how we we get our, our sample, um, the different techniques that exist fall into two broad categories. The first is probability probabilistic or probability sampling. Um, and this occurs when the researcher can specify the probability that each member of the population will be selected for the sample. 
In other words, random sampling, right? This is a concept we've spoken quite a bit about. Uh, it's difficult to do, not not often used in, in psychological research. Right? Um, and the other methods can fall into the realm of non-probability or non-probabilistic sampling. And this occurs when the researcher cannot specify these these probabilities. So as I said, most research in psychology is going to involve non-probability sampling. Um, and some examples of, of these, these types of non-probability sampling in, include convenient sampling, um, which we've discussed. This involves studying individuals who just happen to, to be available and who are willing to participate. Um, so there's no assigning any any numbers and picking numbers out of a hat in order to get these people into our sample. It's just, okay, you're here, you're volunteering to participate. Awesome. I mean, we want you, right? Um, snowball sampling. This exists, or this is when um, existing research participants actually help recruit additional participants. So people who participate in our study, we might say, hey, do you mind passing this along to your friend, right? Or passing along this information. Uh, basically, try to help recruit new or more participants. Snowball sampling um, is particularly helpful when you're dealing with um, small populations. So as I said before, um, say transgender people make up a very small percentage of uh, of the the general population. So how do you actually find transgender people to be in your study? Um, it's easier now with uh, the internet and with social media, but even still, um, what well, is likely to occur is that you would get, say, a transgender, uh, a transgender participant in your study, and say, "Hey, you know, would you mind passing or uh, letting some of your other transgender, um, some of your transgender friends, would you let them know about this study so that they can participate as well?" And then you ask them to kind of recruit their friends, and then ask those friends to recruit their friends, so on and so forth forth. Um, that's where this idea of snowball sampling comes from. You take a snowball, roll it down a hill, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger as it as it rolls down. Um, like I said, it's less, say, uh, less necessary with the internet and social media, but um, still very helpful. And for a while, this was kind of the only time that you could study um, you know certain populations that you could get samples from from certain populations people who are not you know uh, who are minor, like minorities or extreme minorities in the in the population there's not a lot of people to study to begin with so just even trying to get a hold of them uh, would be difficult. Uh, we also have quota sampling, and this is where subgroups in the sample are recruited to be proportional to those subgroups in the population. So what does this mean? Well, it means, well, let's just say if we wanted to have a, um, a sample that is representative when it comes to race, right? We want to have a, a racially diverse, not just racially diverse, but a racially representative sample. Um, we know that in the general population, blacks, African Americans make up about 30% of the general population. So we would want our sample to also consist of 13% or so of uh, people who identify as black or African-American. Um, when it comes to, say, 
Latino or Hispanic um, individuals. You know, there's different estimates, of course, based on uh, what part of the country that that we're in. Um, but you figure about 20% or so, some some higher, uh, some areas higher. So we would also want those people to, let's say, or the the people in our sample who identify as Latino, Latina, or or Hispanic, uh, to also make up that proportion or percentage that that exists in in the general population. So quota sampling is a way to to do that. Basically, make sure that these subgroups are represented in your sample to the same extent that they exist in in the general population. Um, and then, of course, we have self-selection sampling. This is when we don't have to do anything. Um, individuals just choose to take part in the research on their their own accord. We don't have to approach them or ask them or or anything. They kind of just find us, right? Um, this is more common or happens more frequently with online research where people might just uh, stumble across say personality tests or something and they're like hey that sounds interesting let me let me just do that because I've got five minutes to kill I'm bored people might just you know participate um, there are some websites that will pay you to participate uh, pay you a small amount of money to participate in in surveys and to participate in even some research um, and you could go to those those websites and just start participating in in surveys and, and you know get these small amounts of money the researchers aren't coming to you you're you're going to them right um, okay what else do we got here so when it comes to random sampling or probabilistic sampling um, we know that this is not something that is is done very often in psychological research because it's uh, extremely difficult to do um, but survey researchers are much more likely to to use some form of probabilistic sampling um, and this tendency for that for them to do this is because the goal of most survey research is to make accurate estimates about what is true in a particular population what is true in a, in a particular group uh, uh, of people um, and these estimates are going to be much more accurate if the the people that are being asked were chosen randomly um, again with psychological research we're much more interested in uh, what is true about the particular variable that we are studying not the people per se right um, so compared with non probability sampling um, probability sampling requires a very clear specification of the population you have to know exactly who it is you are interested in knowing some information about. Um, so, for example, the the population that you might be interested in might be all the registered voters in New York State, let's say, um, or it could be the it could be all the Americans who consumers who've purchased a new car in the past year. Or it could be women in, from Long Island um, over the age of 40 who've had a, a mammogram in, in the last decade. Whatever your population uh, of interest is, you, it needs to be specific. This is, you know, the, the population, this is the group of people, this is the population that you want to know about. So you need to, to clearly um, specify them and once you have clearly specified them um, then probabilistic sampling requires what's known as a sampling frame 
and a sampling frame is essentially a list of all the members of that population um, that you're going to use to select your respondents, to select the people who you are going to survey. So how the hell do you get a list of all of the people in the population? How are you going to find a, a list of all the registered voters in New York State? That one's actually easy. That's public information, right? So the New York State Board of Elections will, will have that list for you. But what about people who bought a new car in the past year, right? Well, there's got to be some place, somebody who's keeping that that type of information uh, that you're going to have to, to try to get that, that list from. Uh, but sampling frames can come from a variety of sources, and sometimes it's just the telephone book if you want to know about uh, people who live in a certain area code, right? Um Let's say you know, women over forty on in in Suffolk County, on Long Island. Uh, you might just look in. What is it? Five six thirty one area code out there. Start you know randomly selecting phone numbers and asking people. You know, is there um uh. Female over the age of 40 living in the household. You might have actually gotten calls like that uh, before. Um, what they're doing is trying to identify people in their, in this population uh, of interest here. Um, lists of registered voters we know. Hospital and insurance records. Those are going to be a little bit more difficult to get. Uh, particularly medical records because of HIPAA laws, privacy laws, right? Um, in some cases, a map can serve as a sampling frame, so allowing for the selection of particular cities that you want to study or sample, rather, um, or streets or individual households that you might want to um, select or sample. So... Uh, the Nielsen ratings, when we hear about this TV show had a Nielsen rating, had all these, you know, uh, six million people tuned in to watch this TV show. How do they know that? Did they interview six million people? No, they, they did not. Uh, Nielsen is a sampling with a, a sort of TV rating um, corporation organization that uses very high-tech computerized selection process to select particular households um, in particular geographic areas and that particular household can represent 60,000 people so whatever that household was watching and you know for about a week or two I was in Nielsen household um, a couple of years ago but I don't watch TV TV I watch stuff online right so they want to know you have to keep track of what you're watching and what channels and for how long and all this stupidness there so uh, I stopped doing that. Um, but they basically will use, I would have served as like a representation of, of a certain population, right? So, of interest. Um, so, so there are lots of like, ways that you can get information from, say, a smaller group of respondents that you're then generalizing to, to a larger group. That's what, take a look at all the political polls that we have going on right now. When they say, you know, Biden is up in, in this state by this many points, Trump is up in that state by this many points, how do they know? Did they call every single registered voter? No, they didn't, right? They, they drew a sample of registered 
uh, voters. And part of the, um, you know, sample that they drew, they, they, they got the list of registered voters, um, typically based on the people who voted in the last election, because those are quote unquote likely voters. But every political poll that you see now that says, you know, Joe Biden is up by, you know, four points or so, um, in, in whatever state, or Trump is up by four points in whatever state. Look at the bottom of that poll, at the bottom of the screen. It'll say margin of error, plus or minus a number, right? Basically means, yeah, Joe Biden's up, say, three or four points, or Trump is up three or four points, but the margin of error for this survey is five points. So what does that mean? It means they're statistically tied. There's nobody's winning in that state, right? They're all within the margin of error. Um, and we, we know that what that means. It's, it's not statistically significant. So those of you who are sure of a particular outcome next week, don't be so sure of it uh, because a lot of people were very sure of a particular outcome last election cycle and that is not the outcome that happened so um, these polls are not always accurate um, hopefully they're more accurate this time hopefully pollsters learn from their mistakes uh, from from the last election and have tried to you know mitigate some of those there Okay, so simple random sampling. We have been through this several times. This is done in such a way that each individual in a population has an equal chance of being selected for the sample. Um, stratified random sampling is when the population is divided into separate, uh, say, subgroups or quote unquote strata. And this is usually based on demographic characteristics. So, we might take the general population and we might, you know, create these strata, these, these different groups, let's say based on race or based on income level or based on education, um, level, um, or city, suburban, urban, uh, rural, whatever it might be. And then now that we have these people in these different groups, then we randomly select from each of those groups. This stratified sampling helps to make the um, sample more inclusive or that you get a more representative sample. Because remember, just random sampling, just by random chance, you might end up with a sample of all white people. That's a possibility with randomness, right? Or a sample of all black people or a sample of all college graduates. And, you know, those are not typically going to be helpful to you. Uh, a sample of just one group or disproportionate number, over-representative uh, number of, of a particular socio-demographic group if you're interested in studying the whole population. Um, we could also do proportionate stratified random sampling. So this is, I guess, kind of spoke a little bit about this or was hinting at this in, in the last um, example when I was just talking about stratified sampling in general. Uh, but this can be used to select a sample in which the proportion of respondents in each sample or each subgroup uh, matches the proportion of the population. Um, so this kind of ensures that, you know, our sample of respondents looks like the, 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 the population in general, right? So that when we say have a breakdown of, um, of the population by gender and race and class and ethnicity and religion, we're going to have that same type of breakdown in our sample. Uh, we could do that using proportionate stratified random sampling. Uh, disproportionate stratified random sampling can also be used to 
sample extra respondents from particularly small groups, allowing valid conclusions to be drawn about those subgroups. So again, using our example of transgender uh, people, and I keep using that example because it's, uh, again, a, a uh, group of, of individuals that's relatively small. So there's, there's a growing body of research that is occurring, um, but it helps explain why, well, there's a lot of reasons why there's not a lot of, of research on transgender um, folk, but some of it's political, of course. Uh, but some of it's also just trying to get enough people who are transgender that you have a large enough group that you can start making, uh, that you can have external validity, gen being able to generalize outside this small group. So if we wanted to, um, let's say, compare, you know, different populations, or I'm sorry, different socio-demographic groups, and in Oneana, let's say, well, we might need to oversample Black and African American uh, participants, right? Um, because if we, if the the participants or respondents in our sample matched the proportion of that exists in the population of Sunni or of uh, Oneana in general, then we're not going to have enough uh, people in that group to make any meaningful comparisons. So we might need to over sample. Um, and that's what disproportionate stratified sampling uh, would be. Um, and then we have cluster sampling, and this is where larger excuse me, larger clusters of individuals are randomly sampled, and then individuals within each cluster are then randomly sampled. So what does this mean? Well, let's say if we wanted to do a survey on, um, uh, let's say we wanted to do a survey on rural liberal arts colleges, students who attend rural liberal arts colleges. Well, we can't, I mean, we could, but that would be insanely time consuming, um, get the, the list and contact information from every student who attends a, a rural liberal arts college in, in this country and then sample from them. But instead, we could use cluster sampling. And that means, let's say if there are a few thousand uh, rural liberal arts colleges, we could randomly select maybe a hundred of those, right? From those thousands of Sunni Onianas that exist all over uh, the country, let's randomly select a hundred of those. And then from those hundred schools, we could randomly select people um, who would be taking place in our survey. So that's what cluster uh, sampling is about. Um, okay, now, of course, when it comes to um, sampling in general, there's always the potential for sampling bias to, to occur. That could exist with probabilistic sampling as well. Uh, but probabilistic or probability sampling was developed in large part to address the issue uh, of sampling bias. But remember, there's always going to be, quote unquote, that margin of error. There's always going to be the potential for, for bias uh, in not just our sampling, but also the potential for error in our measurements and um, just statistical noise is just the way things ex uh, things happen in in research. Uh, but what is sampling bias? Well, it occurs when a sample is selected in such a way that it's not representative of the entire population and therefore produces inaccurate results. One of the major issues uh, that a lot of people think was uh, 
responsible for the the polling being so wrong in the last election, 2016, was that uh, pollsters were still relying uh, too heavily on landlines, physical phones in your house, and they were not sampling enough people who had cell phones, right? Um, so there might be something inherently different about people who still have landlines compared to people who have cell phones. So uh, this was, uh, they were essentially getting or sampling people who were not necessarily representative of the entire population, or at least the entire population of people who were going to, to go vote, right? Um, so there's one form of sampling bias that even careful random sampling can't um, control for. Um, so even when you're super careful and you use true random sampling, you still run into the possibility of non-response bias. So non-response bias is when people refuse to participate in your survey, right? And um, you you might have, have experienced this. You get a phone call. Someone's like, "Hi, do you have a minute to talk about?" It? And you're like, "Click." Right? No thanks. <laughs> Maybe there's something different about you and the person who actually sits there and says, "Sure, let me tell you about what I think and who I'm gonna vote for and all that stuff," right? So it's very possible that people who don't respond or refuse to participate are actually different in some way or maybe even multiple ways than the people who actually do participate and do respond. Thus, we're getting, you know, the we're only getting one side of the story there, really. We're only getting the opinions of people who chose to answer this to participate in this survey we don't know anything about the people who didn't participate in this survey why because they didn't participate in the survey you didn't get to ask that many questions there so non-response bias is um, an issue even for the you know even for the best most the most bestest way of sampling, it, it, you still can't avoid that. Um, okay, when it comes to conducting the the survey, uh, there are four main ways to, to conduct surveys. The first is in-person interviews. These, again, are, are very time-consuming. Um, it takes a lot of people to do this. Uh, when... I mean, I'll get to an example of all of this in, in, in a second here, all four of these in a second here, um, which is the, the census that, that took place this year. So in-person interviews cost, can cost a lot of money, cost a lot of time. Uh, you could also conduct um, interviews by telephone. Still, you need people power, um, you need equipment, Still could take quite a bit of time, uh, less so than in-person interviews, but still considerable amount of resources needed. Um, you can conduct surveys through mail. Um, there's less of an issue of time, but there's still costs associated with it, um, especially if you want them to send the survey back. You better put a return postage on it because people are going to be way less likely to send that survey back if they got to put their own stamp on it just because it's a pain in the ass to do. Um, and the fourth way, which is becoming pretty much the standard way, um, is over the internet. Um, so I said the U.S. Census that, that took place this year. It actually used all of these um, methods of trying to get people to to complete the census so uh, people were encouraged to 
complete the census online. Those who didn't complete the census online uh, within a given period um, were sent a census form in the mail. And I actually uh, participated in the 2000 census. Um, I, I was an office worker, not a, not a census taker. Um, I helped, like, you know, arrange or manage uh, people who went out to, to do the in-person interviews. Um, but it was all by, by mail at that point um, in 2000. Again, that was 20 years ago, right? Um, so nothing was happening or, over the internet. Everyone got mailed a, a survey to complete and that you needed to return. And if we didn't get it back, you, we would send you a reminder, a postcard reminder. Please send your census back, your completed survey back. Um, and if that didn't work, people would call you and try to, you know, get the information for the census through the phone uh, or over the phone. And if we couldn't reach you then, then we had people who would actually go door to door. These are census takers, right? Uh, they would go door to door to, to count. I mean, the point of the census is to count how many people there are. It's mandated by, by our constitution that we, we do this, right? Um, and that took a lot of people and a lot of hours and a lot of money. Um, but people who have not completed um, the census over over the internet, not, I'm not sure if they got mailed a uh, uh, census form this time, this time around. But I definitely know that they there are still census takers. There are people who are following up uh, or people who have not completed the census census form. So, so go, go do it do online. online. It's just much more, more uh, efficient, efficient way. that way. So, so there, are there are a couple of, of um, misconceptions, misconceptions, let's say, let's say uh, uh, called preconceptions. Here, here is a misconception um, about the about internet, internet research, research internet, internet surveys. surveys. Things have, have changed. changed. Uh, some, uh, some of these, these might, might have been true, true maybe, maybe 20, 20 years, years ago. When, 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 you know, I, I started using the internet with AOL. AOL. Yeah. And that was, and that was like, like in the like 1990s, 90s, right? Um, at that time, yeah, it was mostly young white guys <laughs> on the internet. That was pretty much it. Um, nowadays, it's much more diverse, right? So uh, a concern is that internet samples are, are not demographically diverse. But t tons of research findings, tons of studies that look into um, uh, these issues have actually found that internet samples are actually more diverse than traditional samples when it comes to, to many domains, um, although they are not completely representative of the population because, you know, my parents are in their, their mid to late 70s. They're not online. They don't know how any of that stuff uh, works. So, uh, of course, there are you know, people who um, are also living in extreme poverty. We have extreme poverty in this country. Um, you know, they're not going to, to be online either, uh, or not as much at least, right? Uh, but by and large, they're certainly more, when it comes to samples uh, that we, we do experimental research on, much more diverse than say freshman college students in, in psychology 101 or 100 class. Um, another preconception is that internet samples are maladjusted and socially isolated or depressed. Basically, people are spending all their time online. Maybe they're losers or have no friends or crazy. Um, again, maybe, maybe 
the really early beginnings of the internet, but now it's everybody. Everyone is on their phones all the time, constantly, right? Everyone's online. Um, so what does the research show, again, um, that internet users do not differ um, from non-users on markers of adjustment or depression. So actually no difference there. Um, another preconception is that internet Base findings, research findings, differ from those obtained from other methods. What does the research actually show? The evidence so far, and there's a ton of it, suggests that internet-based internet findings are consistent with findings based on traditional methods, on uh, things like self-esteem and personality, um, but you might need some more data. Um, in other words, when it comes to internet uh, research, trying to tap into some of these other uh, constructs that we, we, we might examine, say, through assessment, in-person type of assessment, you can get the same findings. You just might have to collect more data, ask more questions there. I'm going to take a quick break and then we're going to finish this uh, lecture up by talking about quasi-experimental research. So I'll be right back. Okay, so let's move on to quasi-experimental research. So it's chapter 8. Um, pretty short chapter. Um, it basically discusses how quasi-experimental research is different from actual experimental uh, research. So the prefix quasi means resembling. So quasi-experimental research is research that resembles experimental research, but is not, uh, tr is not true experimental research. It's lacking in one of the, the major components of experimental research. So although an independent variable is manipulated in quasi-experimental research, either a control group is missing or participants are not randomly assigned to conditions. Um, there might be you know, some other control issues that are involved with quasi-experimental research, but those are the two big ones, is that there's either a lack of a control group or there was not a random assignment to experimental or quasi-experimental conditions, the conditions of the independent variable. So in terms of um, internal validity, quasi-experimental uh, quasi-experiments are generally somewhere between non-experimental studies and true experimental studies. So they kind of exist in this this gray zone. They're not true experiments, but they're still more internally valid um, than, say, non-experimental studies, such as correlational uh, research, right? So quasi-experiments are most likely to be conducted in field settings um, in which random assignment would be very difficult or impossible to do. Um, also, when uh, we're doing research that wants to, say, make gender comparisons, compare um, you know, males and females or, or men and women, um, even within an experimental setting. So if I, let's say I'm doing a jury study, jury decision-making study, and I want to, um, I'm going to manipulate a variable, but I want to see, you know, whether male jurors or, or female jurors respond differently. Um, that's not a true and variable gender, right? Um, I can't, randomly assign people to to a gender um, so it would be a quasi-independent variable or it would be a grouping variable 
Um, I can't call it an independent variable um, because it's not an independent variable. That example that I gave, though, um, is would still be an experiment because I, I still have another independent variable that I'm, I'm manipulating. Um, but if I wanted to examine gender differences in there, eh, we're we're getting into a gray zone here about um, you know whether this research is um, experimental. If I were only looking at, at gender differences, then this would be a, a quasi-experimental um, study. So there are a couple of different uh, types of uh, quasi-experimental designs. Uh, we'll start with the the one group designs. So uh, within this category we have the one group post-test only design. And this is where a treatment is implemented well, treatment is or an independent variable um, is manipulated and then a dependent variable is measured but there's just one group just one group of individuals you do something to them and then measure what happens um, so if we let's say had a group of people who are suffering from anxiety and then I give them some vitamin or or something uh, that I say is going to help them with their anxiety I just get this group of people give them this pill and see what happens right we measure their anxiety after this is actually the weakest type of quasi experimental uh, design why? Well, the major limitation to this study is that there's no control group. There's no comparison group. Uh, how do I know their anxiety would not have gone away just by itself, right? How do I know that the any changes to the dependent variable isn't just a result of the placebo effect? So these one group post has only designs not not so great there right not a whole lot that we can tell uh, about these findings not a whole lot of faith we can put in these findings right um, we also have the one group pretest post test design this gets a little better uh, still not a true experiment but we're getting closer right because this resembles a within studies or within group um, study right within groups design um, because we have a pretest we do have something to compare um, the post test measure to so in in this type of design the dependent variable is measured twice once before the treatment or before an independent variable is manipulated and then after the independent variable is manipulated um, problem here again there's no control group so we don't know uh, if this change between the pretest and post test would have happened anyway and there are We'll, we'll talk about some of the reasons why it might have happened in a second here. Um, but another problem is that the order of the conditions are not counterbalanced. So we, we don't know if it's just the fact that the participants were already measured on the dependent variable, just being measured on it once before might affect how they respond on it the second time around. Uh, so some of the other possible explanations that might explain why the post-test scores are different than the pre-test scores might be what we call maturation, meaning that these scores might have changed anyway, um, either because 
participants are just growing over time um, they're learning or if we're talking about something even like uh, depression most depression now of course there's treatment resistant depression and there's depression that just never never goes away but the average major depressive episode is going to to go away eventually um, even without treatment I believe the the average last time um, you know I looked at these numbers was about nine months that's the average so some people will, will you know overcome the the major depressive episode sooner than that and and some people are gonna gonna take a, a lot longer than that, but that's just the average with with no um, treatment at all. Taking antidepressants and and doing talk therapy can significantly lessen the time um, it, it takes to to overcome the major depressive episode by by months, you know. So, but. If just left alone um, with no treatment whatsoever, uh, people with major depression will get better or just over time, right? So this idea of maturation just through time or because your participants are changing in some way. Um, the idea of testing. So this is when the act of measuring the dependent variable uh, during the pretest affects participants' responses at the post-test. One example, or an obvious example of this, is if um, if I give you the pretest. I mean, the pretest and the post-test have to be the same thing, right? The the same measure there. So you need to make a comparison between the scores. So I give you a depression test at the beginning of this the study. And then you you basically you got to see my dependent variable. These are the things I'm looking for. Changes in you, right? You get to see them. You say, okay, yeah, these are these are the things that the the researchers are studying here. So that's a whole lot of demand characteristics. You basically kind of gave away what it is you're you're studying. So having just completed the depression inventory might affect how they respond uh, the second time they they complete the depression inventory, even if my treatment had absolutely no effect on them. Um, and you can't rule out this idea of testing. You can't rule out um, social desirability if people... I think or even say like the, the placebo effect also right um, if they are given a list of symptoms that they're rating themselves on and that they know they're going to get some type of treatment they're going to expect that those symptoms are going to decrease in severity so just that expectation might cause them to uh, to report lower severity on, on that same measure, or just social desirability. They they want to be cooperative. They want to help you with your studies, so they'll uh, report it lower um, in severity on the on the post test the second time they take it around. No, that they, they take your your measure. Um, instrumentation can be another issue. This is less of an issue when it comes to say surveys or inventories but if you were using some type of instrument to to measure um, you know your pretest and your post test say some type of computer program or some type of um, other type of laboratory or physiological type of instrumentation uh, just through wear and tear, just over time, uh, the characteristics of this measurement, of this measurement instrument, might change. Um, let's just say, for example, if um, 
you know, let's just say we want to figure out uh, reaction time on people's phones. So we are going to test people using their phone, how fast that they can type and whatnot. Uh, and then, you know, have them go through some, some type of uh, training program to to increase reaction time, increase cognitive response, or what what have you, uh, and then we we have them you know go back on their phones and, and do this thing again. Well, maybe their screens are not as sensitive as as they were when they did the test you know months ago. Maybe there's a, there's a software glitch. Maybe there's something about the instrument that's just not good anymore or that is let's say less accurate than than it was before um and we might mistake that as our treatment or our intervention having some type of effect but it it's not it's simply the instrument is changing typically it means the instrument's wearing out we're getting slower uh or less reliable. Also, um, a big one is regression to the mean. Um, and this is a statistical phenomenon where the it's just a statistical fact that an individual who scores extremely high or who ex scores extremely low on a variable on one occasion will tend to score less extreme on the next time they take that test so um this is why i have to you know half jokingly advise students who take the gre and they they tell me their score and i'm like okay so were you expecting to to do that well and they're like no i didn't uh, you know i didn't think i would i would score that that high um you know, all my practice tests, you know, had me scoring much lower. So, you know, I'm thinking maybe if I really study or really prepare and take this test again, I'll score even higher. And I say, yeah, don't take that test again. <laughs> Why? Well, because what's likely to happen is you're going to score lower if you take it again. Um, extremely high scores and extremely low scores just remember what the normal distribution is all about there's not a lot of scores out there um in in each of these tails so the it's much more likely that you got that really high score or that really low score by chance so if you were to take that that test again or complete this this test or this measurement again, your score is going to actually be closer to the mean um, on both sides, right? Uh, and this is just a statistical reality that, that happens. Um, the more that you take the test, the, the closer you're going to, your score is going to want to get to the mean, where most of the scores are, right? If we remember that normal distribution. Um, okay, we, when it comes to another one of the, the one sample, uh, designs, one group designs, we have the interrupted, uh, time series design. And this is when a set of measurements are taken at intervals over a period of time. Um, so it's similar to a pretest and post test design in that it includes measures of the dependent variable both before and after the treatment but what makes it different is that there's multiple measures of the independent variable of the dependent variable before the treatment and multiple measures of the dependent variable uh, after the treatment so um, instead of just doing one test before the treatment and one test after the treatment you actually measure, you do a few tests before you introduce the treatment, then you do a few tests after um, you introduce the treatment. So uh, one example that is mentioned in your textbook is a manufacturing company 
uh, might measure its workers' productivity each week for a year. So they're going to measure productivity for um, for a year each week. Um, and in an interrupted time series design, a time series like this one that, that is uh, presented here on the screen is quote-unquote interrupted by a treatment. Um, and in a classic example, again, as mentioned in your book, um, the treatment was the reduction of work shifts um, in a factory from 10-hour work shifts to 8-hour work shifts. And you can see here what they were measuring, whether or not this reduction um, changed people's absences, the number of times that they called in uh, sick or that they didn't show up for work. So in this example, the um, researchers or the, the people at the manufacturing plant um, collected some data about, oh, well, each week, the number of absences that were happening each week. So this was before the treatment. So this was when people were working 10-hour shifts, right? And they got a couple of data points about the number of absences each week during the time period when people were working 10-hour shifts. Then it looks like in the middle of week seven, they introduced the quote-unquote treatment. And the treatment here was to re reduce people's shifts from 10 hours down to eight hours. And then they kept counting how many people were calling out, how many absences were there um, each week after the treatment. And they studied that for a number of weeks. And just by looking at this data here, we can see that it looks like reducing shift hours from 10 hours to 8 hours um, reduce absences. That looks like it would be statistically significant. Of course, we got to know how many participants are in there and whatnot. Um, again, the problem here is there's no control group. We don't know if it were the treatment that actually reduced the, the number of absences here. Maybe there was a bunch of layoffs at a at this plant or neighboring plant. Um, so people kind of got scared. And usually when, you know, you're afraid of getting laid off, you tend to, to, to come to work more. <laughs> you tend to, you know, not cause problems because you don't want to be the person who gets uh, laid off next. Who knows? We don't know. That's the problem with this type of study. We don't know if it if it was actually the the reduction in in hours per shift or if it were something else because we don't have a control group here. Okay. Uh, we also have non-equivalent group designs. So non-equivalent uh, group designs are between subject designs in which participants have not been randomly assigned to conditions. Uh, so they're similar to the types of research designs that we are familiar with, that we've been testing out with t-tests, right? Um, except participants were not randomly assigned to to the groups or to the conditions. So it's not a true experiment. Um, there are several types of non-equivalent group designs. Um, the first is the post-test only non-equivalent group design, and this is where participants in one group are exposed to a treatment, and a non-equivalent group, so basically another group, is not exposed to the treatment, and then the two groups are compared. Okay, that sounds like a between groups design. What's the problem? Well, again, if the people were, the participants were not randomly assigned to these two groups. We don't know whether or not the independent, or if there is a change in the dependent variable, we don't know if the independent variable uh, 
cause that change because there might be something just different about this group, the people who are inside this group that are, are scoring differently on the dependent variable than the people in this other group. We don't know because we didn't randomly assign uh, the people to the, to the groups. The groups might be just totally different. So we're comparing apples and oranges and saying, yeah, they're different on a, on this measure. Yeah, well, they might have been different on that measure to begin with. You, you don't know, right? Um, you can try to get around this a little bit uh, with the pretest, post-test non-equivalent group design. Um, and this is when a treatment group is given a pretest. They receive a treatment or the manipulation of the independent variable. And then they're giving a post-test. At the same time, there's a, another group uh, that is acting as a control group that is given a pretest. Um, and they don't receive the treatment. They don't experience the uh, independent variable manipulation. And then they're giving a post-test. This sounds like a great design, except, again, they're non-equivalent groups. Random assignment was not used. So again, we don't know if it's the independent variable that is really causing a difference in the dependent variable, or if these groups, just their, by their nature, their makeup, um, whether that's going to be something about the groups or what's causing the change in the dependent variable. Just kind of showing you how important random assignment is, right? Um, we also have the interrupted time series design with non-equivalent groups. So this is very similar to uh, what we what we just saw with the interrupted time series design with the the one uh, person group um, or the one person group with the with the one group design. So this involves taking a set of measurements at intervals over a period of time before, um, uh, of time both before and after the intervention or the treatment condition or the um, independent variable in two or more non-equivalent groups. So again, running into the issue here that we didn't use random assignment. So we don't know if our independent variable is really what's causing changes in the dependent variable because uh, our groups are not equivalent. They, they, there could be something about the groups that are different that are causing the changes in the dependent variable. Um, Pre-test, post-test design with switching replication design. This is getting a little closer here to, uh, say, experiment to an experiment. It's, uh, let's say, getting more valid, um, or the, the results might be a little bit more trustworthy here. So let's just take a look at uh, this title again. Uh, Pre-test, post-test design with switching replication, right? What does this mean? Well, it means there's non-equivalent groups and they're administered a pretest of the dependent variable. Then one group receives a treatment while the other group serves as a control. Um, the dependent variable is assessed again and then the treatment is added to the control group. And then the final, and finally the dependent variable is assessed another time. So essentially what you're doing is taking two groups, giving one of them a treatment uh, or independent variable, keeping the, the other one as, as a control, testing them again on the dependent variable, then adding the independent variable to, to the control group, and then testing both groups again to see if there's a change. So like I said, this is getting a little better um, except we still have the problem of non-equivalent groups. There's still way too many 
potential extraneous variables. We can't be completely confident um, that it's really the treatment or the independent variable that's causing changes in the dependent variable. And finally, switching replication with treatment removal design. This is similar, but instead of adding the treatment or adding the independent variable, we're actually going to be taking it away and seeing if there's a, a change. So this is when there's a treatment that is removed from the first group when it's added to the second group. So essentially what you're doing is flipping those two groups. If you had a, uh, a, a group that was getting the independent variable or the, the, the treatment, and then you had another group that was acting as a control at some point, control group now becomes the treatment group the treatment group now becomes the control group and you see if there's any change in the dependent variable um, we've got some issues there of course because they're non-equivalent groups so lots of extraneous variables but we might also have an issue here because it was not randomized um, issues of, about context effects that we were talking about in survey research. We, we might have some issues here um, when it comes to order effects, right? Um, so we're missing the random assignment, but we might also be missing out on some um, experimental control as well. Okay, so that kind of wraps it up for chapter eight. So um, I know this lecture is a little long, but it's two chapters in, in one. Um, I believe next time we will do a review of ANOVA and post hoc tests. Okay, so I will see you then. Take care.